Hey, hey, it's David Strong by Lee, personal trainer and registered dietitian in New York. Today, let's spend the next few minutes talking about resistance training and building muscle. This is a common topic. Do you need to resistance train? Do you need to weight train in order to build muscle? I think that is a common question that we're going to address today. We're not going to address every single tenet of it. We're going to address the basics and hopefully... By addressing the basics, you can get a better idea of what methods might be more effective or less effective for helping you build muscle, get stronger, become more athletic, and explosive. And I think a sub-question for this one is, how do you build muscle? By understanding the principles of how resistance training can build muscle, we can start to understand how the actual process of muscle building works. We're not going to get too scientific because I am trying to be cognizant of my audience, but we're going to get scientific enough, just enough, so the things I'm saying aren't being pulled out of my butthole. So do we need resistance training to build muscle? Yes and no. Your body's ability to build muscle in response to external stimulus is dependent on a couple of key factors. Key word here is external stimulus, gravity, is an external stimulus because you have your organism, you have your body, gravity acts on your body versus if you go to the moon or if you go in space, which is why many astronauts, if they spend too much time in outer space because of the lack of gravity, they develop osteoporosis, weak bones. And when they come down to space or they when they come back down from space, they get to start to develop their tendons, and ligaments, and bone mineral density again. Now, to be sure, There are so many things that go into building muscle. No one can give you a firm recommendation on how much muscle you can build and how quickly it'll take. A lot of different factors we'll go into today. For example, it's well known in the scientific community that sleep and recovery play a crucial role in building muscle. We know this. So if you don't get good sleep for two weeks, how will that impact your muscle building efforts? We don't know for sure. What we do know, though, is it could hinder your efforts. How can we say that the acute effects aren't the same as chronic effects? In other words, just because you get poor sleep now, does that mean it won't or will affect you somewhere down the line? Many of us might get poor sleep tonight, but not feel it until two days. Or maybe we'll feel it tomorrow. Maybe we won't feel it in two days. I think it really depends. We also have to look at the accumulation effect. Just because we don't have good sleep today doesn't mean it wasn't affected from the sleep last night and the night before. Get what I'm saying? Now, this is a big reason why training can get frustrating because there is no straight line to results. You're going to zigzag, and while you have a lot of control over how much results you see and when, there is an unpredictable element to it. Think about if you were on a plan and that plan spelled out exactly what you needed to do to build 10 pounds of muscle in 12 weeks. You did exactly that, and you built 10 pounds of muscle in 12 weeks. How willing are you to stick it through, no matter how uncomfortable it might be? With the prospects of knowing you're going to build muscle guaranteed, you're probably going to make the compromises and the sacrifices to attain those muscles. But fitness doesn't work that way. Health doesn't work that way. There are some things that are just good enough you can achieve. But when it comes to anything beyond that, when it comes to being optimal or optimizing your results, sometimes it can just be a crapshoot. You've heard that saying, everybody is different. Personalization is key if you want optimal results. The problem here is not everyone wants optimal results. Some people can be very happy getting subpar results because those subpar results are probably better than what they have right now. Let's talk about the three main factors I can identify right off the top of my head. The first one, your current fitness levels. How conditioned are you? Can you run a mile? Can you do a push-up? Can you do a chin-up? Can you do a bodyweight squat? These are various things that can help you get a better idea on what your fitness levels are and what type of program might be appropriate for your fitness levels. This is why a consultation or an evaluation with a certified personal trainer or fitness expert is extremely important 
and insightful because they can give you an idea of what type of program is going to be right for you if you want to build muscle. Second, your training experience. Your training experience will directly lead into your fitness levels. If you've been training for five years on a consistent basis, you are going to be more fit and more trained. Your body is going to have been adapted to the training stimulus versus somebody who hasn't worked out, who's fresh off the couch. Thirdly, your age. We know that age is a known factor to decreasing levels of key anabolic hormones like testosterone and human growth hormone. And this can explain why people over a certain age might experience better muscle growth and retention with hormone replacement therapy, HRT. You know, things slow down as you, as you age. We know this. You know this. Speed, agility, coordination, metabolism, your body's ability to recover. If, you st- if you're 80 years old and you stacked up against a 20-year-old, who do you think would win in a fitness contest? Probably the 20-year-old by default simply because they have vitality and youth on their side. Now, the less fit you are, the less it will require you to start building muscle. And the less training experience you have, the less is required for you to start building muscle. And that's because your body is not used to the stimulus. If you're brand new to training, these are called rookie novice gains. You do not want to waste them. What if you have a spotty training history? Can you still get these newbie and rookie gains? Yes, you can, just not to the same extent. What do you think is the best time? When do you think is the best time to actually do resistance training? You only, you only get this once in your lifetime. Puberty, especially for boys. Puberty is the absolute best time to start training because that's when your testosterone levels are skyrocketing. For females too, girls around puberty is probably one of the best times to start training because that's when the hormones are in flux. This I, this idea of the body training and adapting to a certain stimulus is called the general adaptation syndrome, GAS for short, in which the body goes through certain processes in order to adapt to that stimulus. When you have training experience, the body has already been exposed to the stimulus in the past. So you have to do something different, more intense in order to spur more progress. And in order for your body to progress more, you then need to abide by a principle called progressive overload. This is when you make things a little bit more difficult over time to give your body a new stimulus. It's kind of like learning a new skill or a new language over time. You learn what the basics, and then you advance into more complicated topics as you get those basics down and you start to become more proficient at whatever you're trying to learn. All right. So next, we talked about how certain factors might how certain factors might influence your ability to build muscle, right? So then, what do we knew? What do we need to build muscle? First and foremost, we need tension. Muscles respond to tension. The tension can be created on your own or with external resistance, such as body weight, leveraging, and weights. Gravity is a form of tension because you're glued to the ground unless you're trying to jump or you're going, whatever, you're just glued to the ground. Now, physi- physiologically, you can create tension just by sitting there and contracting your muscles as hard as you can. If you make a fist, I'm making a fist right now, I feel the muscles in my fingers, my palm, my forearms, my elbows, my biceps, my shoulders are contracting and I'm squeezing them hard. You can build muscle this way. It's called isometrics. But the ceiling and the threshold will be lower versus if you were to hold a 15-pound weight in your hand because not only are you creating that baseline level of contraction, that isometric by squeezing, now you have 15 extra pounds. Your body has to involuntarily contract against that extra weight, which is going to create more tension, more contraction, more potential for muscle growth. What this does is it lifts the ceiling of muscle building. And also, you can continue you can uh, adhere to this pr- progressive overload principle in which you're adding a little bit of weight over time. And this is why external resistance has been shown in research to be much more effective at building muscle because you increase that stimulus. So then how do you know you're working hard enough? A lot of people think, "Oh, I'm sore. That means I've definitely done something." And while I have uh, there are a lot of fitness experts out there who believe Soreness is not a good indicator of whether you had a workout or not. It might not be, but it might be. How, what other methods, short-term acute methods can you use to determine if you worked out or if you worked out hard enough? Soreness, in other words, it's called delayed onset muscle syndrome, 
is an indicator of muscle breakdown indicator. It's not the conclusive evidence that it is muscle breakdown, but it's an indicator of muscle breakdown because the lactic acid, the waste product, makes the muscles more sensitive, which is why you get sore. Now, how do you get sore? Soreness can be a cause of novelty. I've had many clients who are in great shape. They do a different exercise, not necessarily more intense. They've done a different exercise and they're sore the next day. There's this component of mental and emotional involvement with a particular exercise. If you have to focus a little bit more to learn a particular exercise, it might increase the chances that you're going to be sore even if you don't make the exercise any more difficult or more intense. Meaning, you might not see better results from this exercise. You just were focused and dialed in a little bit more and you are sore. In that case, soreness isn't a good indicator. It just means that you did something a little bit different. So there are two ways to basically tell if you're going to experience results. Consistency and effort. Are you 80% consistent with your workouts? If your workout plan says for you to go to the gym five days per week, are you at least going to the gym four days per week consistently? And then effort. Are you working hard enough? This is the hard thing to dial down. Consistency is pretty easy. You have a plan. You try to stick to the plan. You try to buy by the frequency. Effort, though, is more subjective. How do you know you're working hard enough? And this is where... The argument of subjective and objective parameters come into play in relation to what type of results we want. If we want optimal results, we have to bust our butt on a consistent basis, on a more consistent basis. If we just want to be in better shape, we just need to work a little bit harder than what we're currently doing right now. And that's quite easy, especially if you've never worked out before. Just going for walks is more intense because it's different than what you're currently doing. But if you're currently walking five days a week, five miles per day, you might need to add something else on top of that. You might have to actually do some resistance training. You might need to go out and get some weights and start lifting at the gym or with a personal trainer or doing something different. Now, if you're being consistent yet not seeing results, and perhaps it is your efforts. If you're busting your butt yet not seeing results, perhaps it's your consistency. If you're doing both, Perhaps you're not on the appropriate plan or you're not recovering well enough. Take a look at your plan. Is it personalized? Take a look at your recovery. Are you sleeping enough? Are you eating enough? Are you drinking enough water? Are you going to the bathroom? Are you stressed out? Are you trying to do your best to relax and manage your anxiety and depression and your stress? Those are some things you need to, to look at a little bit more closely because those are also the things that can have a negative impact on your recovery efforts. How consistent do you need to be? How much effort do you need to put in? Well, I can't speak for everyone since everybody is a little bit different. Consistency usually means you're working out at a moderate to high intensity every 48 to 72 hours for a specific muscle group. I know I mentioned earlier if you had a five-day workout plan that you're sticking to four days, that's an overall consistency regime. This is talking about well, how often should you apply a certain stress in a muscle this goes a little bit more into programming. This is to make sure that you're placing a consistent stimulus on your muscles, not necessarily being consistent with your workout. If you worked out your upper body, your shoulders, your chest, your bicep, your triceps, and your back on a Monday, ideally you want to address those similar muscle groups, maybe in the same way or in a different way, around the same intensity on a generally speaking for general fitness, generally speaking, for general fitness in 48 to 72 hours. In other words, if you trained on Monday, you want to train again Wednesday or Thursday, you want to target that same muscle group. A plan I frequently give to people who are able to make it into the gym four days per week for anywhere between 45 to 60 minutes per session, Monday and Thursdays, they're doing upper body. Tuesdays and Fridays, they're doing lower body. and They're doing abs on Mondays and Thursdays on their upper body days. That means they're exposing particular their particular muscles twice per week to stimulus. And I want to make sure that they are they're attaining sufficient volume and freak volume and intensity. These are the two things that are going to create tension. What do I mean by intensity and volume? Intensity means how heavy are you going? The example we used earlier where you're contracting your arms and then sticking a 15-pound dumbbell in your hand, that 15-pound dumbbell is intensity because it's heavier than what you're using without any weight and is going to create involuntary contractions. That is intensity. 
That is how much weight you're able to lift. When it comes to volume, volume means how long are you holding on to that weight? How many repetitions are you doing? If you're taking that 15 pounder and you're doing curls, biceps curls for your biceps, for your arms, if you do it for five repetitions, which takes maybe 12 seconds versus doing it for 12 repetitions, which takes 40 seconds, you have more time under tension with the 12 repetitions. And thus, you're going to create more contractions. Your muscles are going to be contracting for a longer period of time. It's going to induce fatigue through continuous tension. And that is what's going to build muscle. You want sufficient intensity and you want sufficient volume. There are plenty of programs out there that give you sufficient volume because when you're working out long enough, you're doing enough repetitions, you're going to increase your heart rate. You're going to start sweating maybe. You're probably going to get red in the face. Your muscles are going to burn and get fatigued. To a lot of people, this gives them, these markers give them the impression that they're getting a workout. Whereas some people, for me, me, for instance, when I was a competitive power lifter, I didn't always go for the burn. I wasn't necessarily going for muscle either. I was going for primarily strength. What you'll find, though, is if you eat sensibly and you go for intensity over volume, you can still build appreciable amounts of muscle because it's really difficult to lift heavy if you're lacking in the muscular development department. Muscle and strength go hand in hand. They exponentiate each other. They improve each other's ability to progress. If you're stronger, you have a higher potential to build muscle. If you're more muscular, you have a higher potential to get stronger. And to do that, you need sufficient intensity and volume applied to your body, organism every 48 to 72 hours in general with good recovery methods, being in a good nutritional status, being in good hydration status, managing your emotions. I just wrap everything up into one pretty nice nutshell right there. Okay, so how quickly should we be able to build muscle? That This is such a hard question because whenever I say this number to people, they're not overly impressed. But when I say, oh, you can lose 15 pounds, 10, 15 pounds in a month if you do things correctly. Like, oh my God, 10, 15 pounds, that'll be fantastic. How much muscle can I build? You can, pr- on a, if everything is going correctly, you can probably build one pound of muscle on average per month. What that means is an average of 12 pounds of muscle a year if things are going correctly. Do you know anyone who can build 10, 12 pounds of muscle year in and year out on a consistent basis. That means in five years, they'll have 50 pounds of extra muscle. I don't know a single person who has been able to do that, even elite athletes who have been able to do that. That means somebody who's 150 pounds in five years will be 200 pounds with 50 additional pounds of muscle. That is difficult. Think about how long it takes somebody, company, a company to build a house versus Demoing it. Demoing it takes so much shorter time than actually building. Because building, you need to create the structure. You need to put things together properly. It needs to be orderly. Whereas with demoing, it's just boom, breaking it down. I think it applies very similarly to the body. The body is much more efficient at breaking things down than building it back up. Which explains why if you've gone a long period of time without eating or you've trained fasted, this is something we could talk about in another segment, you do, you do heavy, high intensity, high volume resistance training on fa- in a fastest state, maybe overnight without eating anything, your body will be quick to burn muscle and to use the amino acids that are contained in the muscles as energy. All right, I want to wrap this up because we talked a little bit too long. This has gone on for a while and I want to keep this under 20 minutes. This was a hairy topic. This was a big topic. Do you need resistance training to build muscle? Yes and no. You do need resistance training. Do you need to lift weights? It depends on what type of goals you want to achieve. You can probably figure out for yourself what methods actually adhere to certain guidelines, physiological principles, exercise science principles of making sure that you are hitting sufficient intensity, sufficient volume with sufficient frequency. If you can if you can satisfy those three criteria, 
you are going to be well on your way to optimizing muscle growth. But then again, you have to define what optimal means to you. Not everyone wants optimal muscle growth. Some people just might want, okay, I just want muscle growth. How much muscle growth? 10 to, 20, 10 to 12 pounds a year under optimal conditions. If you're lucky, you can get half of that in a year. Five years, about 15, 20 pounds of muscle. I'll take that. So this is David Strong by Lee. I hope this was helpful. I hope you listened to this all the way through. I know 20 minutes is a long time, especially if it was a monologue like mine. I know I can go off on tangents every once in a while, but I'll try to circle it back. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, shoot them over to me, david at strongbylee.com. If you have any specific questions about your own particular situation, I'll be more than happy to get back to you. Just give me a few hours, a couple of days. Make sure I take care of my clients first, and then I will take care of you. Otherwise, until next time, be strong.